name is Jessica McDonald, and I'm a publisher for IOP Publishing. So today I'm serving as the moderator for this event. Um, our panelists will be speaking to the need for diversity, equity, and inclusion and their value. We're assuming by being here, you also find value in this concept. And we'd welcome varying perspectives, of course, and invite you to raise questions for our panelists. Today, each panelist will present, and then we'll welcome the questions from the audience once the presentations are over. To submit your questions, simply go to the bottom um, of the screen, and there's a Q&A that you can type your questions in. So I'd like to introduce our panelists, um, Dr. Christina Bach, the senior, a senior research officer for the National Research Council of Canada, Kim Eggleton, Research Integrity and Inclusion Manager for IOP Publishing, and Adrian Plummer, the Director of Publications for the Electrochemical Society. So we're going to start off with Adrian. So Adrian, welcome you to um, begin your presentation. Thank you so much, Jessica. Thank you for that introduction. Thank you for all the panelists um, for participating today, um, from both IOP and from our, our valued volunteer, Christina. Um, I wanna thank also for all the um, audience members that are with us today. Um, and obviously for living, living, living with this technology that we have, um, if you weren't able to join us live today or you're watching a recorded at, um, version of this, um, we thank you for taking the time to, to on your own time to, to invest your, your, your energy into us. Um, to start us off and just create a sense of connection, um, it is important to establish that during this webinar, we will aim to, as Jessica shared so eloquently, to elevate the conversation on diversity, equity, and inclusion in scholarly publishing, commonly referred to, and you'll hear me say this, as DEI efforts, um, and highlight the importance of it and what ECS and its partners are activated on to realize the benefits of DEI efforts. Um, so to kick us off in a, in, a, in a safe way, I offer this to everyone, two of personally my favorite quotes that inspire me and in the work that I've done um, in DEI efforts um, in other organizations and in my career. Um, the first is that diversity is a fact, equity is a choice, inclusion is an action, and belonging is an outcome. That's credited to Arthur Chan, for those that are familiar. Um, the other is that inclusion is not bringing people together into what already exists. It's making a new space and a better space for everyone. Um, and that's accredited to George Dye, for those that are familiar. So here at ECS, through our meetings, our conferences, our awards, our publications, um, and our other programs that we offer, we connect with the electrochemical and solid state science students and professionals from an array of ages, geographical regions, genders, cultures, et cetera. Um, our fact is we are diverse. Um, but being diverse isn't enough. In order to benefit from our diversity, we must be intentional in our efforts to create equitable practices and meet the call for opportunity and access for inclusion. Um, some of you may recognize the face that I'm sharing as one of our beloved volunteers who um, I'm going to take a moment and just wish him an early happy birthday. Dr. Goodenough will be 100 years old this coming July. Um, he's a very valued um, member of our society. Um, but right above him, I actually am sharing um, a quote from Dr. Susan Hockfield, who was a former president of MIT, the 16th president of MIT, where she shares that creating a culture of inclusion is not an optional experience. It is an indispensable precondition that enables us to capitalize on our diverse skills, perspectives, and experiences so that we can better advance the fundamental research and education mission. I offer this example and this quote and Dr. Goodenough, because in his 2016 prime meeting interview um, with our CEO at the time, he vulnerably disclosed as a child, he grew up um, outside of the city in the country. And in the country with his family, um, he would ride his bicycle to school and think that, you know, these people that live in the city don't know much or understand how we live in the country and the things that we have to go through. Um, he also shared that despite becoming a revered scientific contributor, as we all know, to know him to be, as a child, he struggled with dyslexia and couldn't read like other children. Um, he described leaving home at the age of 11 for an affluent boarding school um, as a struggling scholarship student that his father obtained for him. Um, he would describe um, this scholarship and this school experience as a life-changing event for him. 
Um, he shared stories about his life that led him on the path of science and discovery, as well as all the individuals, not all, but many of the individuals who supported and guided him along the way. And when asked about the dissemination of science, scientific content, um, he shared his belief that scholarly societies are essential um, in the business of fostering partnerships to serve the community at large. He emphasized the role of societies in creating space to convene the community to, to further scientific advancement. I, for one, personally find it difficult to, at this point in my life, imagine a world without the technology that John contributed to. Um, but the reason I highlight his story and this, this perspective on his story um, is that the, the, the support and the opportunities that were created were the seeds of John's journey. Um, and there are many others across the globe that are waiting for that opportunity. And this is one of the ways that ECS can support that opportunity. Um, which leads me to another one of my, my quotes. Um, again, I'm, I try to remain inspired is that talent is equally distributed, opportunity is not. Um, and our mission is to help that change is from Dr. Cornfield, um, who is um, from the National Equity Lab and from Harvard Law. Um, I offer a personal example, a little bit beyond John's, um, as I've shared with many along my own personal journey. Um, as I began my career in scientific societies, I was in contact with a student um, from Uganda. She was a scholarship student at Oxford. Um, and my organization at the time um, offered a $3,000 US dollar scholarship to attend our annual conference that was taking place in Italy. Um, when I contacted her about the award, she expressed her gratitude and honor, but then she shared that she couldn't accept it. Um, I was surprised. Um, the response, and I shared this with the committee um, who you know, had to rediscuss this, and they were surprised that she would turn down the funds and to my surprise, some were even disgusted and called her ungrateful um, and wanted to turn their attention just to other candidates and just kind of let the situation go. Um, I took the extra step to ask her why she didn't want to accept the award and she burst into tears. Um, and she explained to me that her village in Uganda was 90 miles away from the embassy where she'd need to apply for the visa. Um, um, it was Italian embassy, she had to go to to get the visa. Um, if the visa was awarded, she would then need to return to her village, pack her belongings, travel to and from the meeting, have accommodations, meals. The cost to simply travel from her village um, exceeded a thousand US dollars just to obtain the visa. Um, and that wasn't really even a part of the grant or the award that we were providing her. Um, her family only had enough resources to make sure that she could get to and from Oxford for her studies. Um, with her permission, I explained her story to the committee. Um, I worked with them to increase the award to an amount that would really cover her costs. Um, she was able to attend the meeting and connect with hundreds of her peers, which was something that she would otherwise never have had the resources um, or the access to do. Um, I give this example because the committee was very well intended and wanted to create an opportunity for a student from her region of the world, but they really hadn't considered the story of a student from that region of the world. Um, which leads me to the final thing that, I, that I'll discuss and um, hoping that I've inspired people through this conversation so we can take in the, the content that Christina and Ethan will share with us. Um, as I shared earlier, diversity is a fact, right? Um, we're surrounded by it every day. And as a technical society and an international technical society, we connect with the worldwide community in solid state and electrochemical science. Um, and ECS and community members are likely to connect with people from all walks of life and sections of the globe. As I shared earlier, ECS is diverse and that simply being diverse just isn't enough. Um, we, we do have to look at being intentional and navigating through our own biases. I know that people see the word bias and they get terrified, right? What am I doing wrong? I'm, uh, you know, bias is not a bad, mean, ugly thing, right? We all have biases. All biases are a part of the puzzle pieces that make us individuals who we are. Um, they build our beliefs and support systems and the biases reinforce our beliefs, value sets and support systems. The challenge is when we come together as a community is do you know your biases and can you see past them to realize the benefits of diversity? Are we truly taking advantage of our diversity 
as an organization to move the ECS mission to be inclusive and equitable, benefiting from our diversity. Um, and that's a concept that I've looked at for many years. Now, I've only been with ECS a, a very short time, just a little bit over a year. Um, however, in my 20 plus long year career, um, I've worked with many organizations who've made efforts to address diversity, equity, and inclusion. Some recognize it on their own, um, the need to address diversity and, and made intentional efforts to recruit and welcome new individuals and their perspectives. And some were less intentional and were forced to respond to some external challenges um, of accountability from outside the organization, right? Such as calls for the leadership to be more reflective of the community that it serves, right? One of the classic platitudes that I've heard during um, my time in, in technical societies and in my career, um, for many who I believe to be well-intended colleagues, well-intended colleagues, um, is we simply need to have more women in the organization, right? Um, that limits diversity conversations to gender and, and only focusing on the optics of diversity. Yet diversity is not limited to gender identity. It crosses into areas of age, race, language, cult, culture, academic achievement, socioeconomical position from the example I provided, and even just general personal experience from your walk in life. Um, but as organizations embark on a DEI journey, it's important um, to embrace the concept that DEI is a full package. The organization must intentionally work on all three to realize the benefits. So let's talk a little bit about the benefits and what that means, right? One of my favorite talks, and I'd encourage everyone to take the 16 minutes it takes to watch it, um, was from Dr. Catherine Phillips of Columbia University several years ago. Um, in her talk, she shares details of her study on the performance differences between homogeneous groups and diverse groups. When presented with that challenge, with a, a challenge or a problem, um, the homogeneous groups seem to just work very pleasantly and well together. They had the same experiences, they had all the same information, the same background, and they could come up with a solution to the problem. They were comfortable and they spit out a solution. But the diverse groups really actually had stronger outcomes and came with multiple paths for a solution. Um, and they actually outperformed the homogeneous groups at about 50% of the time. And that, you know, Dr. Phillips was, I don't know if she was shocked, but certainly was questioning the idea. Um, and she shared that the diverse groups were benefiting from diversity by it being a trigger. People were challenging themselves, they dug deeper, they worked harder, and are focused to navigate through conflict, right, with those who don't share their ideas. They share different ideas from different perspectives um, and were able to not just solve the presented problem, but create multiple paths to solve the, um, the presented problem. The interesting thing Dr. Phillips highlights, which I found most intriguing, is the diverse groups actually left the group much less confident in their answer, um, they, which highlights the true goal of her research, right? Um, it shows us that there is a pain in navigating through DEI efforts. We'd be remiss if we don't um, engage in that. Um, but it shows us that even through that pain and the hard work, the pain is worth the game, as to, to steal her words directly from the talk. She gives the example that going to the gym, deciding you want to get in shape, deciding you want to exercise your brain, or even as a scientist, venturing in to try and solve a problem. Um, we're not going to do anything by standing in the gym, by standing in the lab, right? <laughs> we have to exert our muscles and do and actually do the work to produce the results and the benefits, to see the benefits of diversity. Um, the work of navigating through those effort will challenge your comfort zones. It will challenge your thinking. Um, it will force us to move beyond those biases that I spoke about earlier. And it does not force you to change your convictions. It does not force you to ignore the things that are, have been important to you or to let down your values. It allows you to embrace the values and the convictions and the ideas and concepts of others to make a beautiful recipe for success for the organization. Um, one could argue that we, could, we should just shy, shy away from diversity, equity, and inclusion efforts because it's hard. Um, I think that in this community, and I'm confident that in this community um, and in the over 100 years of ECS, we embark on scientific discovery and research because it's hard. 
that's exactly why we, we go out and we do the, do the work that we do for the community and why the members do the work that they do to work on sustainability and things of that nature, because it's hard. Um, as an organization here with the publications department, which is where I spend my time here at CS, um, and in our partnership with IOP, we're focused on creating and doing the work of that DEI effort. Um, one of the many ways is opening transparency. We want to create opportunities for new editors, new associate editors, new reviewers to be a part of that process. Um, and also directly working as we are today, as we gather today, working with IOP and taking their recommendations on things that are happening in the industry and working directly with them to make sure that we're staying honest with what's going on in the community. We are ECS, but we are a part of a partnership that spans beyond well into all of the what's going on within IOP and its other partner journals and its journals directly. Um, it's a healthy partnership that is another way for us to benefit from diversity and to hear the different perspectives that are coming out of what's going on in the industry. Um, I'm going to stop there. I'm going to share the spotlight with Kim so she can give us more, I, more of an idea um, of what ECS and IOP and its partnership are going to be actually doing to support these DEI efforts that ECS so deeply believes in. Okay, thank you so much, Adrian, and thank you to ECS for the invitation. Um, I'm really delighted to be able to speak to you today. Give me one moment while I just share my screen. Um, bear with me, apologies. And okay, we're ready. Thank you all again. Um, my name's Kim, and thank you, Jess, for the introduction. And my role at IOP Publishing is Research Integrity and Inclusion Manager, which means I spend half my time telling off naughty people and the <laughs> other half of the time trying to encourage lovely people to come and work with us and making sure that we're being really inclusive. So what I'm going to talk you through today is just our kind of journey over the last couple of years through diversity, equity and inclusion. Um, it was something that we really didn't do anything on um, pay any attention to until about 2018. Um, and we always had this view that, oh, we're a publisher, right? There's, yes, there's inequity in science and there's diversity problems within academia, but we can only publish the people that send stuff to us. So, you know, we're not, we're not making it worse. We're just dealing with what we get, okay? That's science's problem to solve. Um, and, and I think, you know, I think a lot of publishers probably felt the same, but why then do we see statistics like this still persisting? This was 2018. And we were seeing women had less chance of being accepted. Um, we were seeing a, a huge range of submissions from China, and yet only 17% um, percent of our accepts were coming from that region versus the USA, where we had relatively a small number of submissions and actually 16% percent of our accepts were coming from that region. So there's a definite geographical imbalance there. Um, and so 2018, we really had a look at those stats and a difficult chat with ourselves. Um, and said, you know what, this isn't right. Um, this isn't just reflective of the situation in academia um, because different people clearly have different chances um, in terms of getting published. So we thought, okay, let's look at the literature and work out what this might be caused by. Um, and so what we did was we had a look at a load of studies and I'll, I'll throw loads up on the screen now, read them in your own time. I'm not gonna read them out to you. Hopefully the slides will be shared after the event for you to read through at your own pace. But essentially studies not only show that the demographics of the authors submitting the work plays a part in whether the work is accepted or not, but also the demographics of the gatekeepers. So that's the reviewers, the editorial members, editorial board members, sorry, that also is having an impact on whether the work is likely to be accepted or not. So there are biases at play all over the place here. It doesn't just matter who you as an author are um, and where you're from, you know, how advanced in your career you might be, how many times you've published before. It also matters who's reviewing your work because they, as we all do, are coming to their role, whether it's a, a reviewer role or an editorial board member role, making a decision on a paper, they're coming with their own biases as well. And so what we realized was by looking at our own data and the literature that actually 
we're not a passive player in this space at all. We really do have a role to play and it makes a huge difference. And we sort of thought, okay, well, yes, there's a lot for us to do, but it's probably all unconscious, right? There's everyone's well-meaning. And actually we had a look through, again, some published literature and some of our own examples. And I would say that the examples I'm about to put on the screen now are extreme, um, but there is very conscious bias definitely occurring within the peer review and publishing space as well. So I'm pleased to say not all these examples are from IOP, they are from other journals as well. Um, but it's quite clear to see that reviewers are certainly revealing their biases quite openly. And it's our role as a publisher to make sure that these kind of comments never get through to the authors. But we also wanted to dig a little deeper and work out, well, why are these, why are these kind of beliefs still persisting and how are they allowed to manifest themselves in what we think of ourselves, you know, a very well educated system. Um, so when you put those real life examples of conscious bias and the studies that we saw around hopefully unconscious bias, we realized that journals and publishers are in a position to make the lack of diversity in academia even worse. Because as we all know, whether we like it or not, academia is sadly measured on who publishes where, how many times do they get cited? Um, and until that system changes, we are hugely influential within that academic space. And so we start to see that actually, if we're not allowing people to participate in the publishing area, we're disadvantaging their entire career. And so we as publishers and journal owners, editors, we have a real responsibility here to not, not make it worse and hopefully make it considerably better. So we need to root out any bias within the publishing system that's perpetuating the inequalities that already exist and try to turn that around and ensure that we're creating that inclusive and equitable space. So the more positive side of my presentation is gonna be talking a little bit about what we're trying to do as a publisher and ECS is fantastically coming on this journey with us to try and make publishing more inclusive and a more welcoming space. The biggest and most dramatic thing we've done is we announced at the end of 2020 that we are gonna move our journals to a default double anonymous system. So some of the people on the call will know this as double blind. We've moved away from that terminology and the industry has moved now to descriptors more like double anonymous um, or single anonymous. And effectively, this means that the reviewers who are reviewing the work are not going to know the identity of the authors anymore. Now, that's pretty big thing for, for physics publishing and, and STM publishing more generally. Single anonymous, so the reviewers know who the authors are. That's been the standard for as long as any of us have worked in the industry and, and well before that. Um, but in social sciences, we actually see that double anonymous is the default. And when I explain this to social scientists, they're like, what, why would you ever go with single? That's ridiculous. Um, and so we've done a lot of work talking to some social science publishers and some of our authors and reviewers about how they'd feel about changing peer review processes like this. And we experimented for a few years with Double Anonymous, offering it as an alternative for some authors on some of our journals. And we found that the response has been phenomenally positive. Um, it's increasing in terms of popularity. Some of our partner journals came on board and said, hey, we wanna do this too. Um, and interestingly, the data that we're seeing from authors and reviewers about their experience outperforms the data that we see from authors and reviewers under the single anonymous system. So authors feel that the reviews that they're receiving are more clear, uh, they're more thorough, they're more timely. Um, the authors feel like they've had a fairer shake, that there's that there couldn't possibly have been any bias. We all know that's not strictly true, but you know we hope that we're rooting out some of it. Um, and the reviewers also have left comments for us, you know, saying I actually felt like the shackles were off a little bit. I didn't have to worry about how many times has this published person published before? Where did they study? Who was their supervisor? I could just focus on the work. And it was actually quite a liberating experience. So with all that information to hand, we made the decision that we're going to move our journals over. And I'm pleased to say that the majority of our journals are now operating on the double anonymous peer review system as a default. 
Um, we're starting to gather data on that now and the initial signs are really interesting. Um, it's slightly too early to say what impact it's having on various demographics, but we are collecting and sharing that data through a partnership um, with some researchers who have a full-time PhD working on some of the data that we're sending out of this. So there will be more to come on that. Um, there's been a really good response on social media. Again, people are welcome to read this in their own time once the slides are shared. The other thing that we're focusing on, um, and Adrian alluded to this as well, is that we really need to expand our reviewers and our editorial board networks. This is, these are the gatekeepers, right? These are the people who are making the decisions and the recommendations on the work. And we know from our own data and the published literature that the demographics of these people are having an impact on what's getting published and what isn't. And when we looked at our reviewer pool and the makeup of our editorial boards, it was crazily outnumbered with a huge focus on the West. We had a lot of um, participation from the UK, from Western Europe, from the USA, and very little participation from Asia, Africa, Latin America. Um, and we really took a cold hard look at ourselves and said, this isn't right. And it wasn't that we didn't have contacts in those areas. We actually have fantastic representation in our reviewer pool. We just went inviting them. And so we had some really good conversations within our staff networks and within our editorial board networks about why that was, dispelling some of the myths about, you know, not using a first time reviewer. How long does somebody have to have been in the field before you might invite them for a review? Trying to kind of dispel some of those myths. And what it ultimately led to is we've now launched a reviewing course. It's completely free, it's online. We also do sort of webinars as well, organized webinars. And this is a free training course to encourage people to learn about peer review, how to do it and how to do it well. We know that there's a massive disparity. Some institutions almost teach peer review and other institutions just assume that you know how to do it and you'll, you'll find your way. Um, and so we've tried to step into this space and provide a completely free and accessible way for everybody who wants to engage in peer review to learn how to do it and do it properly. And alongside that, we're also changing some of the technology and the mindset we hope amongst our editorial teams to try and be more inclusive and invite more of a broad range of reviewers, certainly in terms of geography, in terms of gender, and also um, academic experience, because everyone's got to start somewhere, right? If nobody invites you, you'll never review a paper in your life. We're also trying to be very transparent about what we're doing. And part of that is being able to collect and share better data. And of course, we need to be mindful that we're doing this sensitively and within the guidelines. Uh, we're based in Europe, so we're thinking about GDPR. We're thinking about you know, protected characteristics. We really wanna make sure that we collect this data only for reporting purposes. It doesn't get factored into any kind of um, editorial decision-making. But it means we can then start looking at the data and saying, OK, well, what are the acceptance rates for women versus men? What does it take for a Chinese researcher to be published versus a researcher from the States or from Uganda or from Colombia? Um, what do our editorial boards look like in terms of demographics? Are they really representative of the physics community, accepting that the physics community itself is not fantastically representative of society? And so we're collecting that data and we're sharing that data. So on any of our journals, you can go on the homepage and you can take a look at where the accepted articles were coming from by both geographic um, base of the authors and gender. And you can also see our editorial board um, membership statistics on our corporate web pages. This holds us accountable. It keeps people aware of what's going on. We can track change. Um, and it's transparent. And that's absolutely what we all should be doing in this kind of space. And the last thing I wanted to share with you was a policy that we put in place last year. Um, and this is a no brainer when you think about it. But actually, the publishing industry was very, very um, reticent to accept this policy. And it's only because of a real fantastic group of activists that sat down with us and explained the impact of not having a policy like this on their lives. And it ultimately comes down to the fact that when you've published a work, you cannot change the name of the person that published that work. It's the scientific version of record. It will ne never be altered. Um, and actually what we were realizing was that for people who maybe 
we're going through gender conversion, religious conversion, we're getting married, divorced, changing the name for any reason, we're having to make a decision. Do I change my name in my professional career? Do I sacrifice all those works that I published before and that aren't now going to count for my promotion and tenure? And we were forcing them almost to either keep their old name or forego credit for the work that was published in that old name. And so we've changed our policy and we now allow people to change their names. It's an incredibly open-minded policy. We don't require proof. Um, sorry, my slide skipped automatically. Um, we don't require proof of the name change. You know, we, we make this on trust um, and it's been incredibly, incredibly well received. It's handled with the utmost respect and confidentiality. But some of the quotes that I've received from people genuinely had people crying on the phone saying how amazing it is that they're finally able to change work that they published maybe 15 years ago. That's really quite impressive and seminal in the field. You know, it's got loads of citations and they haven't really been able to associate themselves with it because it might out them or, you know, give people an insight into their personal life that they really don't feel comfortable sharing. And so this is just one of the ways we can create more inclusive, welcoming and safe space for everybody. Um, we're by no means finished. Diversity is never going to be solved. Um, we're always going to have more work to do. But I just wanted to take the opportunity to share a few of the things that we've been working on. And I hope that we'll see the same kind of rate of change and fantastic support from our partners like ECS as we go forward. So we'll obviously have questions at the end, but in the meantime, if anyone wants to get in touch with me, I'm on Twitter most of the time. Um, so feel free to come and bother me on social media. Thank you for listening. And I think I'm passing back to you, um, Adrian, for a brief introduction to Christina. Or is it straight to Christina? I'm sorry. Straight to straight Christina. Straight to me. Thank, thank you, Kim. No, Christina, no worries. all yours. I'll here anyways. Uh, share the screen. Um, thank you, Kim and ECS. Uh, I consider this a very important topic um, in general diversity and inclusion. I do, I'm a scientist, so I don't, do not have the same hard and accurate data as, as Kim can present, but I can certainly present to you the view of the scientists today. Um, and as such, um, um, I'd like to ask some, some questions. And these are, what can a publisher actually do? Can a publisher actually encourage DEI in, in STEM? Um, uh, well, and therefore, what, what are, the, are there biases in, in scientific publishers? What are there, why are there differences? And what can publisher, editors, and reviewers do to create a difference? Um, to the question, is there a bias in scientific publishing as Kim already uh, shown? Yes, there is a bias, but the bias seems to be different than for diversity, equality and inclusion in STEM research and education. In STEM research, we know that uh, it is dominated by males, while women, people of color, Hispanic origin, indigenous and disabled belong to underrepresented groups in, in STEM. Biases in scientific publishers are typical reputational and geographical, as Kim showed. There are, for example, different numbers of papers. The acceptance rates can be different if it's, for example, from, from Asia. Um, but it can also really, really strongly reputational. That can be reputational as being biased by uh, being submitted by a specific research group or a person. Or, for example, uh, work, we know that work from a really good, well-known university like Harvard University is generally conceived as higher quality and it's just automatically conceived without even looking at, at the actual results that are being presented and conclusions. Um, but there could also be other factors in, in scientific publishers than just these two biases. So there are um, data, and Kim showed them as well, that on average, female scientists tend to publish less than male scientists. There's some discrepancies, some say it's about their, um, uh, their actual career lifetime, they publish the same, but often the career of a female is uh, 
not as long as the one of a male scientist. Uh, but there is also studies that say, well, this is not related to a bias uh, that uh, takes place in the peer review process. So what, what, why are there differences? We observe differences, why are there differences? Does this reflect differences in opportunities? Differences in what approaches men and women can have? Could it be that men, uh, that women are more hesitant, so honest, careful? which can all be good properties in science and scientific publishing, but may lead to fewer papers. And another thing, and these are differences that don't necessarily only apply to men and women, it's just a little bit easier to, to measure uh, how many papers are published by a man and a woman. Um, but we also need to remind ourselves that some of these differences are not really um, gender biased, but they can be ingrained and can come from an upbringing or related to society's expectations and, and, and could be cultural. We do know that DI plays a role in scientific publishing. And um, we do know that um, in order for a scientist to actually publish his or her work, the scientist first needs to get to the point to create and publish the work. This means a scientific environment is needed. It means one needs a laboratory, equipment, funding, time, and collaborators. Um, but we also know that the pipeline in STEM is, is thin and leaky, we lose people. Um, there, women are interested in enrolling uh, increasingly interesting enrolling in uh, first year university STEM programs, but from there on, it leaks out. People are dropping out. Uh, there can be switching uh, field, there can be uh, a career interruption, there can be getting a degree, but then moving into a field that is not actual research. You use you, what you learned, but you're not doing actual R&D. And we also do know that harassment is a reality in uh, our working lives and in research. Understanding the differences means that we can uh, start to address them. So it's important that we know it. Um, one cause is, well, we know English dominates science. It's a dominating language. And for non-native English speaking, publishing and writing in English is more taxing than for native English speakers. And an action publishers can take is to uh, provide support for um, a grammar program and editorial support for non-native English speakers. It's also in our nature that we tend to favor what and who we know. So that goes into the reputational uh, bias. And some of uh, action scheme pointed out that can be taken, like the double uh, blind peer review. But I think there are also um, other actions that publishers and ECS can take. And these are like you promote articles from underrepresented um, scientific groups, it can be as highlights, weekly digest. Some other things uh, publishers can do, there's some of the um, lower hanging fruit that can be done relatively easily and in the short term. And that is just simply to increase the outrage to invite underrepresented groups to publish articles. Consider making it easier financially, uh, lowering or waiving article processing fees for underrepresented groups. And as Kim already pointed out, I think it's really important to widen the pool of reviewers and to diversify the editors. I mean, it is a, a fact that um, the the editors, editorial boards of scientific journals are not diverse at all. Um, there are very, very few females and geographically um, a, a bigger diversion is needed as well. Um, other lower hanging fruits are of course, the uh, ensure the use of inviting an inclusive language and uh, appear. And that it's in um, all communications in, um, and including websites. And there are unconventional ways. So these are the more longer term um, actions that could be taken. 
And that could be organized discussion meetings uh, of the research from uh, researchers from underrepresented groups who um, enable to connect with these researchers to get a better understanding from both sides, what work is relevant to them, what is expected in um, scientific publishing, or perhaps even change the view of scientific publishing to realize, well, we, maybe we need different metrics in, in measuring um, the, um, how, how successful a scientist is. Uh, workshops, which include editors, reviewers, and potential owners from underrepresented groups, um, could be could be uh, useful. And uh, really to learn about the expectations, and and have a two-way expectations. And yes, changing potentially changing um, the metrics on how we measure scientific qualities. Uh, could be changed. Right now, there is a very, very strong focus on what is the impact factor of the journal that we are publishing in and how many citations do we have. But at the end, it's the quality of a paper on how long it lasts and impact it has that should be relevant. And changing some of these factors and really focusing on what work is actually published, what are actually the results and what is the meaning would be much more powerful and would also help to disseminate science easier. This is just some of the thoughts I have, uh, just some food for thought. And um, thank you everybody for being here. Um, I do believe sci scientific publishing plays a role in enabling diversity, uh, equity and inclusion in science. And I'm glad that we're having this discussion. Thank you. I'm passing back to Jessica. Thank you, Christina. And thank you to our panelists for your presentations and your discussions. So we will um, want to remind everyone that if you would like to ask a question of our panelists, you can simply type it in um, at the bottom. There's a Q&A button and you can um, submit those. But I, I did want to kind of get us, uh, start us off with, with some questions for our panelists to explore some of these areas a little more. Um, so first, so for Adrian, um, so you work really closely with the publications of ECS, of course. And so just, you know, what what is ECS doing to improve diversity across these publications? Um, some that are have been around, around for a long time and some that are brand new. I'm sorry, Adrian, if you could just unmute. Yeah, there Thank you. you. Two years and we still haven't figured that or I haven't figured that out um, <laughs> through virtual communications. Um, just to repeat, the, the two things I can speak to are transparency and um, intentionality, right? There, there is absolutely an intentionality that we have um, to create opportunities first for new editorial staff, new editorial supporters. Um, one of the ways that we are, and, and I know that that is carried throughout our editorial boards. It is absolutely something that we are looking um, to, first and foremost, we will be having a meet the editors event, right? At our 241st meeting that'll be taking place in Vancouver in a couple of months, um, actually one month at this point. <laughs> having my editors on the floor that we work with every day, connecting with um, the community will create opportunity. So I would encourage anyone to come, right? Meet the editor, find how you can connect with the society. Um, start as a reviewer, you know, be a part of the, be a part of the activities that we can have um, at the editorial level. Um, one, another way that we have is an, with, with our intentionality and our transparency, is we have an editorial opportunities page directly for the Electrochemical Society. So as editors are appointed, they're appointed for a term to support the society and we want to invest in their success, but it is not a lifetime appointment, right? It is not something that we intend to have someone sitting in a seat that never roll up and create new opportunities for others. Um, so as that individual, um, 
comes up for renewal or their term is coming to an end, it will be posted on the ECS website and we have a mechanism for you to submit your, your CV, submit your consideration for wishing to be considered for that role. And that's shared directly with the leadership of our editorial board to look at your history, look at your work history, look at what you've contributed either to the community in general or to ECS. Um, and to consider you for a reviewership, consider you for an associate editorship, um, consider you to engage with society at any other level. Um, so we want to make sure that the doors are open um, for people to gain access and, and be transparent and do that with full intentionality. Thank you. Thanks, Adrian. Um, we do have um, a question from one of our attendees, and this would be for Kim. Um, so um, it's a note on the single single anonymous review work both ways. Um, sometimes reviewers are harder on top people in the field than others because um, in quotes, they can do better. So the question from this person specifically is if there's any data on how well um, the double blind process works, it's almost always easy to figure out at least the senior author from the reference from the references. I'm so glad you asked that question um, because we're just starting to get the data through now. We know from other fields and some other small studies that have been done on journals that have switched from single to double, um, but they, we're going to have a wealth of data because we're having like 50 odd journals change at the same time. So we're just starting to see that data come through now. Um, and what we're finding is that, and again, I reiterate the point that this is early data, um, but it looks like work that's been anonymized, so gone through the double anonymous system, is more likely to be accepted um, than work that was under the single anonymous system, which is interesting in itself. Another thing that we're measuring, which speaks to this question beautifully, is um, we're asking reviewers and authors how they found the process. Whichever method they were using, we've been doing these these sort of surveys for ages, but anyone, whether they were successful in their submission or not. So even if you're rejected, you get to tell us how was your experience? Did you know what could have gone better? Was the review fair? Did, you know, was it timely and so on? We're seeing the um, the review that the surveys come back more positive from the authors, including the rejected authors under the double system than we are under the single system. So people feel, even if it's, you know, whether the data supports it or not, they're feeling like they're getting a more fair, balanced and, and equitable process, which is fantastic. That's what we wanted to see. But we've, we've been a little sneaky. And in our reviewer survey, we've asked the reviewers, how, would you feel confident in guessing the authors if you've reviewed an anonymous submission, how confident would you feel guessing the authors? And if you feel confident, do you wanna have a guess? And I'm really, really pleased. Again, it's early data, but 85% of reviewers are either unable to guess or guessing incorrectly as to who the authors are of this work. And, and like um, the person who asked this question, I've read studies and, and it's been the common thing that's come back to us is, oh, you know, my field's niche, I know lots of people, I'll recognize the writing, I know who's doing what. And, and I'm sure that is the case in some disciplines, um, but it seems to the tune of 85% that that's not what's really happening. Um, so that was a great day um, when I saw that statistic and it's one of those statistics that I check on a weekly basis, but it does seem that reviewers may think they know who the authors are, but are actually not quite getting it right. So early days, but the, the signs look, look really positive. Um, just a, a quick follow-up to that, Kim. Um, so people you know, are having trouble guessing, um, even though they, they are pretty confident they can. Um, a lot of our um, authors use preprints, um, especially archive. Um, so how does the double anonymous work then in that, in that realm? Another really, really good question. And we're not in any way suggesting that people stop using preprints. Preprints are a phenomenal thing. Um, and we really want to embrace and engage with that. What we want to do, and, and all we really can do, is ask reviewers to not go hunting for whoever the, the author might be. Respect the system with which you're engaging. We're asking you, 
you know, to provide comments on the work, not the person that did the work. We're not going to provide you with that data. You know, please respect the system. We can't stop them going and finding out. But I think in this kind of Google age that we're in, even without preprints, if you really wanted to know, you could find out because people are, you know, publishing where they're getting funding from and their, their institutional web pages have, you know, current work in press and so on. So, um, yeah, I, it's it's not perfect, but I do think there are systems that can work together and complement each other as long as all the actors within the system are, are you know, acting responsibly. Great, thank you. Um, I know, um, question for uh, Christina. Um, you did, you touched on this briefly in your presentation about impact factors and citations often being used to measure the quality of a journal. Um, that discussion is um, brought up a lot where, you know, some people <laughs> um, ask about the, the value of um, impact factors, but we seem to be, you know, they seem to be a part of us now. Um, are, and you mentioned that maybe other metrics that could be used to bring more attention to underrepresented groups. So I was wondering if you could expand on what those may be, the fairness of impact factors and citations for those groups. Yeah, um, well, I think it's a discussion that needs to be, be hold or had, have. Um, but I mean, reality is when, when I started in, in science, in, in research, um, I, I didn't even, I wasn't even aware of the impact factor. It's really something that has come new and, and uh, it's really being created by publishers. And it's kind of sad, it's a number, right? I mean, so we have a number, here's the impact factor. We measure it in the number of citations over two years or so may have been expanded to five years um, and, and the number of cites. And so it's a number we can measure and then we rank. But I mean, it doesn't really reflect the quality of the science, right? Um, so um, we're not only doing a disfavor to um, potent potentially underrepresented group, but we're also doing a disfavor to science at all, um, because we really should uh, look, uh, we really should read the article and, 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 and study the article and, and, and hopefully use the knowledge that, uh, that has been gained. And so, well, some of the factors that uh, it's certainly the life of an article, uh, how long is it being used uh, over, a, I mean, there definitely needs to be measurements over a longer period of time. I think it's also, it's not just the publishers, but it's also a responsibility of um, uh, institutions, organizations and universities to um, start to ignore the impact factor uh, uh, and, and pay much less attention to the number of citations. You, know, you could get the citations because you've potentially not really been publishing something accurate as well, right? Um, so it, it's really um, up to these organizations as well to say, well, um, if you are promoting somebody if you're con in an organization, if you're considering somebody to go for full professorship um, uh, or if you're hiring somebody new, well, we, we are not looking at, we're not just going to count numbers, right? We're not just going to count, well, this is the number of articles that are published in, in that many high impact factors. But we, we're actually going to take our time and, and see what, what was the quality and, and, and read them. So what matrix you would exactly use, we, we, would, we had to, um, this warrants a, a discussion but I mean, definitely something over a longer period of time would be um, appropriate. Um, you know, you, you had to find something like in terms of the, the quality, quality and, and the relevance. And impact kind of says that uh, there is a relevance, but, but if you just measure it by how many citations, it's not, it's not real. So we had to find an order way of relevance measuring um, yeah, as you said, over the period of time uh, the, the paper is being used, uh, how many people build on it, and um, uh, and and uh, is there more technology at a higher level coming out and, and factors like this? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, we're, we're nearly out of time. Um, so I just want to, um, maybe this is something um, Kim, in your role, I know you 
you've introduced a lot to our company, but Adrian and Christina, please feel free to jump in on this too. Just, you know, how do we encourage people who don't feel that this change is necessary and bring them, you know, along with us, maybe just like a, a couple points. Um, and then we do have to leave a minute to, to wrap up. So um, mm -hmm. I just want to hear that from you. I, I, if I have two points, I'll just say two words, data because we're persuading scientists and scientists love data. So data and stories, we're all human and we are all impacted by stories. And I'm so grateful to Adrian and the people that you worked with for sharing those stories earlier on. I know through the work I do, I hear people's stories and how um, inclusivity impacts them in a negative way and also in a positive way. And those stories are how you get change effectively through. Um, so data and stories. Um, I can add that um, a challenge that I had when I entered into not my work at ECS, but the work that I have a passion for, which is diversity, equity, and inclusion efforts, um, is defining all, um, asking yourself, what does all mean to you? If you are that scientist that's trying to see who's in the preprint, in the preprint trying to circumvent the process that you've committed yourself to, ask yourself why and determine um, for yourself, what does all mean to you? If there's someone that's disrupting your space or disrupting what you believe should be, you found your bias and you found the hill that you have to walk over. Thank you. Thank you. Um... I think the other uh, one is like the what, what's already been slowly happening is really to diversify um, editorial boards, right? So if you have yes. more editors from underrepresented groups, I mean, we've seen that in, in science in general, there are um, in certain places like China, for example, where seem, we seem to be more female, seeing more female engineers. And the reason given is because they see more role models as females. So it works. So um, this is something that um, uh, could be, do be done the diversification of editorial boards and reviews. Thank, thank you. Um, I know we're, we're short on time. I just, I really want to thank all of you um, for your presentations. And I do need to um, thank everyone for attending. And I want to turn things over to um, Shannon, our behind the scenes IT um, to wrap up a couple um, notes. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Jessica. Hi, everybody. It's Shannon. I am your friendly ECS webinar series facilitator that you usually see once a month for the ECS webinar series program. Um, I wanted to take this moment just at the end of this presentation one to thank all of the wonderful panelists today and Jessica for moderating. But I also wanted to remind everybody of a couple of few a couple of program updates that we have um, regarding events going on around ECS. So give me one moment to share my screen. And here we go. And I'm gonna do something that I tell everybody else not to do. So let me put it in full presentation mode. All right, so today is Wednesday, March 30th. We have Free the Science Week starting on Saturday, April 3rd. Um, running through Sunday, April 10th. This means that the digital library um, on IOP Science is going to be open and available for everyone to download content from the ECS digital library. This is something we started back in 2015 and has been a great resource for our community. So we love to continue to do this. So please mark your calendars and make sure to visit the ECS digital library on IOP Science for Free the Science Week, April 3rd through the 10th and share with your community. I also wanted to highlight a couple of our upcoming events related to our biannual meeting. So uh, we are having our first return to in-person meeting in Vancouver, Canada, May 29th through June 2nd. This is the 241st ECS meeting. Registration is open and we have a late abstract submission opportunity. The deadline for that is April 13th and the early registration deadline is April 25th. 
And we'd also like you to know about the fall biannual meeting, which is the 242nd ECS meeting to be held in Atlanta, Georgia. The abstract submission is open with a deadline of April 8th and registration is slated to open towards the end of June 2022. If you want to learn more about ECS meetings, please visit www.electricum.org forward slash meetings to see all of our upcoming meetings over the next few years. Also, uh, we know that the ECS webinar series is a great way to connect with our community, especially as we've not been able to connect in person. This is a partnered program between Physics World, IOP Publishing, and the Electrochemical Society. Um, these are technical presentations that happen once a month on a Wednesday. Um, our next presentation is April 20th with Karthish Mintheram on electrification and decarbonization of chemical synthesis, followed by the May 11th presentation with Kevin Moeller on electrochemistry and organic synthesis, exploiting a synergistic relationship to advance both areas. To learn more about our webinar series, you can visit electrochem.org forward slash webinars. Lastly, again, one big thank you um, to our panelists today um, and to all of you that were here with us for this discussion. We appreciate all of your questions and you taking time out of your day. And for those listening record for the, to the recording after we've had, held the webinar, um, please feel free to visit the ECS website at electrochem.org for future webinars, program updates, and any other information. And you can always reach out to us at customer service at electrochem.org. Thanks again, everyone. Have a great day. We hope to see you soon in Vancouver. Bye-bye.